Let's open up the meeting then. Did, did, did everyone read the minutes of the last meeting? Yes. And was that good? Yeah, stellar. I so. so I take a motion for that, uh, approving the minutes. Someone is so inclined there. I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes of the November 2nd meeting as presented. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. It's just aye. Heard it's aye. All right. Okay. I think I see that one. Okay. Um, see, do we have a little public here? Yeah. I'm Gordon. Yes. Can I add a try to add a really quick item to the agenda? Um, so I don't know why not. Yeah, it came up over the weekend. I'm just adding someone to the Merritt Campbell um, committee. Oh, just the name, the name. No, I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure the board's okay with us adding someone if we decide to do that. You know, if we decide to have two citizens instead of just one, because that was what we, had, that was what the motion had been passed. Um, well, that might require a motion then. I, yeah. You want to detail that? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize you were saying go right now. Um, so I guess the, the motion would be that we expand the, the, the number of, the number of citizens on the committee somehow I, I guess I, I hadn't exactly thought through all of it mostly I just wanted to make sure it was in public record that there was at least one other person who wanted to join and that the committee had flexibility to add someone or not so maybe someone can help me because I feel at a loss right now <laughs> yeah well um, I don't know if that's a good idea or not what does uh, anyone have an opinion on that? Adding another member? I do. This Mary, I, I think the fewer people, the better. This is supposed to be a confidential, discreet um, process. And I mean, we're it's already going outside of the select board. And I, I, the fewer people, the better. I mean, if I was somebody looking for help, I would not want um, you know, the more the merrier knowing my business. So, um, no, I, I guess I feel very strongly about this. No, I, I don't even like, I don't even, I don't even like having, uh, somebody, yeah, outside the select board. So, um, there we go. Mary, it's not, um, we're not discussing candidates for the funds. We're just discussing, the. Uh, process of administering the funds and and um, um, so I, I'm not I, I don't think I'm, I'm as worried as as you are about that and and I was just wondering if we might be able to accept the second person without as a guest of the committee and not need uh, uh, you keep the committee as it is and that committee can make any decisions and recommendations and this particular guest if I Thinking it's the person that Martha brought to our attention. Um, so, well, <coughs> I feel pretty strongly, Mary. I, I want to make sure you know you're heard. Uh, well, I'm sure I'm heard. I just I, I raised my voice pretty uh, adamantly, but I I just I don't know. I don't. This just is an extra layer. I don't even know why we're getting into this, but anyway. There we are. Yeah. Well, this is just a committee to look into the possibility of having a case manager. This is nothing to do with the actual requests. And it's my understanding. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's really just, again, the, the processing of how we, how we 
administer the funds as opposed to uh, Phil's getting this or Mary's getting that. If I can just interject though, Phil, I, I think that to a degree that's pretty well said. I think that part of this was to speak towards some people that were uh, definitely some people that might be interested in doing such a thing. Where am I? Yeah. I'm sorry, Dave. I didn't quite catch all of what you said. Uh, I think that part of this was to talk about um, individuals uh, that could be potential candidates to do okay. such a thing. Oh, okay. I. It, it, um, okay. I think we're all we're all then maybe I'll back away and say that we really aren't sure exactly what this committee and how far and what it's going to explore. So maybe we should just keep it as it is for now. Curtis, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I actually have, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on it at all. It's just, I thought it was important to bring it to everyone as it was something that we had agreed to as a group and be able to gauge sort of what everyone said about it. Um, like, like Phil was saying <clears throat> earlier, the, the, the main sort of purpose of that grouping was to think about the process by which those funds are allocated and not necessarily to allocate any of them. Though I hear what Dave is saying, where one consequence of that might be that it, um, you know, we think about who might be able to contribute to that process in the end. I think maybe, maybe if if the board is okay with it, um, keeping it as is, and then um, you know, other interested parties can attend as as guests or, or something might might be a workable solution. I just didn't. I just want I just didn't want to do something that that has some sort of like change that wasn't wasn't talked about beforehand. You know. Okay, so uh, I would agree that we don't need to expand that committee anymore. I would how that will go. But. So, was that? I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, Curtis, did you make a motion? I can't even remember. I, I did not. Okay. I said I didn't. I didn't know what was required, and it appears yeah. that nothing is in the end. Well, so. then we can we can probably just let that go then, uh, as as is. Okay. Um, public comment. Wes, um, do you have uh, something you wanted to bring up? Uh, I noticed in the um, minutes there was a. Um, uh discussion on uh looking at 21 Forkbrook road and a offer of ten thousand dollars from last month's uh, minutes and my um concern was whether there was also uh, a condition of sale uh, that was included at ten thousand dollars that the property would um, be cleaned up and the uh, uh, buried uh, trash that uh, spills over into the stream and uh, is embedded in the property as landfill uh, would be cleaned up uh, as a condition of that sale for ten thousand dollars. Um, Dave, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, Wes. The answer is no, and. I, I had a conversation with somebody that was somewhat representing you and Nancy, and I had a conversation with them. I'm not sure if he got back to you, but, um, you know, there was some things put back to him. But it, the short answer is, um, at this point, there would be nothing to that effect in this purchase and sale agreement. So the um, the trash that's in the stream and the uh, 
hazardous spill that occurred on the property is all going to be going with uh, with the sale with no condition of, of that sale? So Wes, the trash has been there close to 30 years since you sold it um, to the, for the, the owner that had it before it went to tax sale. Um, that's been accumulating under everybody's watch. We feel as that we feel good as to the person that may be purchasing that property. Uh, it probably has the ability to do so more than most. So, uh, let me just correct. When I when I gave that property, it uh, my wife and I gave that property. It was pristine. There was no trash on it. So um, uh, that accumulated um, since that point. Uh, not not due to our negligence and habits. No, but I'll, there's been plenty of opportunity for people to. Um, perhaps tell proper authorities and, and other people that may have known or, or privy to that. Um, so certainly there's been opportunity to perhaps put a stop to what's been going on there. But Wes, you know, we don't need to have this conversation here. I had this with somebody who was representing you and I assume that that person's gotten back to you. And I expressed the same conversation. Um, you chose to reach out to me in that manner and that's the way I commuted back to you. The answer is with this particular offer, we have not attached that to the purchase and sale. And we haven't actually, we haven't written the purchase, purchase and sale, sale yet, yet, but we don't plan to attach it to that. Thank you for that information. Okay. Well, let's move let's along. Move along man. Um, Dave, uh, you said you wanted uh, Victoria Littlefield to be in early on this is she is she with us so yeah. uh, Tori uh, is here um, I don't think she has quite the emergency to get out but uh, it would be best she does have a meeting um, she needs to get to so it would be best to have her um, speak and to move her along so she can get to the next she can get to the next meeting okay all right well let's 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 uh, um, head into that then uh, the approval of our local hazardous mis mitigation plan and uh, so we can hear from Victoria now why don't you go ahead uh, great um, so back it's been a while um, I think back in January um, the town of Heartland hired two rivers uh, regional planning commission to work um, with interested in community members and town boards and committees um, to do the local hazard mitigation plan that expires every five years and currently um, the mitigation plan is expired for Heartland um, but we have received our approval pending adoption um, from FEMA which means the plan has met all of the standards that FEMA sets forward um, for these plans um, I know Dave had sent you a recently updated. There was a couple of edits that FEMA wanted um, from the plan, which was just um, minor, um, you know, just including, you know, past occurrences for more hazards, you know, like, you know, when high wind events happened and what kind of damage it did to Heartland, um, things like that. Otherwise, there's no major changes. Um, but otherwise, the plan is all set for the select board to adopt at this point. And once you formally adopt, FEMA will issue a formal approval letter. And then you guys will be all set for another five years. And your emergency relief and assistance fund status will be back up to 12.5%. So about half of your local match will be covered by the state of Vermont in the event of a federal disaster. Are there any questions? It's kind of like a high level overview. Um, if, if this is the time, this is Phil. Um, I was a little, um, I couldn't follow the document. Now, let me back up. First off, I thought the document was um, extremely uh, technical in nature and well done and Mary and Dave and all the others that worked on it, great job. Um, uh, Victoria, what is the river 
corridor bylaws and the community rating system. It seemed to be included in a number of different sections, and I couldn't quite tell if the department was following that or not following that. Yep. Um, so for ERAF, um, if you have a certain number of things, such as adopted road and bridge standards, a local hazard mitigation plan, a local emergency management plan, and flood, flood bylaws, um, Vermont will cover half of your local match for federal disasters. If not all towns do this, if Heartland went forward and adopted a river quarter bylaw, which basically extends the flood hazard bylaw out farther um, to kind of naturally allow the river to move so it's limiting development a lot more. Um, then your percentage would go up to 17 and a half percent um, and not a lot of towns do that because a lot of Vermont towns all of their development is pretty close to you know the river um, so it's not appropriate for every town um, I don't know if that's something Heartland wants to do in the future or not um, but that's why that is kind of mentioned because um, that's another you know incentive and another way to kind of protect more development against flooding. Mm -hmm. um, the community rating system, I can't tell you too much about that because no one in Vermont does that. Um, so I'm not even sure what it is because no one does it here. <laughs> why, why is it in the report then? Because it's mentioned a few times and obviously my confusion. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just um, something that FEMA wants, you know, everyone to do. Um, and the state does push, you know, like river quarter bylaws, but like at two rivers, we don't push that because it like severely limits development um, along the rivers, even more so than like a flood bylaw does. So we don't really push that too much. But I mean, if you guys are w want to do it, we're happy to help. But it's kind of why we, we have to mention it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, I have a question for you. Um, uh, of the many kind of uh, action items, one of them is uh, documenting infrastructure damage in town. Um, uh, do, do we have any idea how we're going to do that or is that we should just talk offline about that? Uh, I think that's even carried over from the previous plan. Uh, so. Uh, which didn't get accomplished the first time around. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that um, for now it's a matter of, you know, documenting it on, you know, basically putting the items that we know are uh, hazards and kind of putting a priority to it, kind of like the, the um, Jennyville culvert. Uh, but it would be a matter of at now at this point simply kind of documenting it in a kind of like an Excel spreadsheet uh, until we could get um, a little bit more sophisticated with um, uh, GIS or, or some other type of software that would be beneficial to us. Okay. And Rob, a question for you. Um, I noticed that the EAB is in the rankings. Um, I was a little confused with the rankings because if I added up all the numbers, I didn't get nine or ten, whichever came up there. And so it looked like the EAB fell off from the rankings a little bit. Yeah, so if the ash trees were writing a mitigation plan, EAB would be right at the top. Okay. But, but for people, <laughs> the borer is not a, a hazard to us. It's the trees that get damaged by the borer and then fall down in severe weather events. That's where the hazard for us comes. Okay. And so um, those are the major hazards that are listed are things like snowstorms and windstorms and heavy rain events. Mm -hmm. That's so it's it's the removal of the trees from there that are that uh, that's where the borer is going to show up. Okay, Victoria, uh, I have, uh, this is Mary, I, as you know, I have a confession to make that I have not participated because these meetings uh, conflicted with my job. So, um, but I have at the 11th hour edited the document and uh, I was wondering how I could get those edits into the final report. 
Um, you can just email them to me and I'll take a look. And the only thing um, is if it, I, it can't mess up with the standards that were already. Yeah, no, 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 they're all, um, they're uh, editorial edits. I mean, they're just, um, maybe numbers are wrong. Uh, something that sh is, it's referred to as figure 13 is actually should be figure 14. Um, the last page number should be 43 and it says page one, things like that. So, oh yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's fine. You can just email that to me and I'll, I still haven't okay. quite analyzed it yet, but okay. yeah, I'll be doing that. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Mary, in those edits, yes. could you include the uh, now two decade old rename of NETAM to the North Heartland Tool Corporation? You know, I do have that highlighted because I was like, what is that? Okay. <laughs> North Heartland Tool. Is that what you said? Corporation. North Heartland Tool Corporation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Should we include any historic um, highlights? Like, what do you mean? Well, on July 1, 2017, we had the worst flood. It was the worst day of work. Ah. <laughs> Isn't that in there? That's yeah. not in there? Oh, it doesn't, uh -huh. doesn't, doesn't. Well, I knew Dave was powerful, but I didn't know it was that powerful, too. <laughs> right. Wow, Dave. I quickly learned where Allison Road was. <laughs> I did. I do have a. Um, I'm. I'm sorry. I. I forgot who we're speaking with. I feel like such a jerk. But um, I. I did have a question that will help me understand the process going forward. So in April, we had a federal emergency declared for uh, COVID-19. And this plan says that after every federally declared emergency, the plan must be reevaluated or updated or whatever. So w would this version that we're doing count as reevaluating or updating after that federally declared emergency? Would we need to do another one? Do we have to do it after it ends? Do we have to do it once it begins? I just am interested in the implementation of that aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this plan definitely did count as a review. We did talk about uh, the pandemic when we were going over this this summer. Um, and that piece that you're talking about, um, I know some people get hung up on, but it's kind of one of those check boxes. Like, yeah, we're going to review it three months after a disaster, but we all know that is totally not feasible. Um, you know, that's when FEMA starts coming into communities is about three months after a disaster is declared. Um, but for implementing, technically, there's supposed to be a review at least once a year um, just to kind of see, you know, how the town is going forward with all of the actions that we laid out. Um, as far as reviewing after a disaster, um, yeah, the plan's good. I think it says three months or whenever feasible um, after a disaster, but whenever you guys have time and when things aren't crazy um like three months after irene that's that was probably near impossible even after july 1 2017 that big flood um that you know it's kind of unfeasible in some instances um covid that's this is going to be a particularly long federal disaster um i don't know when it's going to end on the federal you know de declaration side but I hope that kind of explained it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, then the question would go to Dave. Um, can we can we make sure we sort of like formalize or get down in the calendar so that we're doing those updates as needed, especially the five year one, so we don't have this lapse in five percent match going forward. Um. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Can we actually approve uh, the certificate tonight if there's going to be additional editorial edits? 
Yeah, I don't see why not. Editorial is not really substantial in my mind. Um, if we were like changing giant paragraphs, then yeah, that would count as a substantial. But I would say it's okay for you guys to adopt if you wish to do so tonight. For what it's worth, I'm I'm fine. I think, that, I think that's a good plan, Phil. I spent a lot of time trying to go over this, but it's there's a lot to it. That's for sure. Do you want a motion, Gordon? Sure, I think we should. Yeah. Okay, I I'll make it. Make a motion that we adopt the um, Heartland, Vermont, 2020 local hazardation plan. I'll second it. Um, <clears throat> is it possible, Gordon and Victoria, that we could, in that motion, designate a representative so we all don't have to go in and sign it? Uh, so select, uh, hey, Curtis, you guys are going to need to come in. You got some Lister stuff. Uh, this one actually just needs to be signed by um, Gordon, but you okay. got list. thinking got, about the thing. <clears throat> we got two lister sheets that need to be signed by everybody. Um, when we talk about the lister stuff, I'll I can leave the stuff down here. Okay, you can come in the back door and sign it and go out without fooling us too much. But, um, okay, yeah. that was my only question. Okay. Okay. I was uh, thinking the same way, Curtis, but I guess it's important that we sign. So, um, any further discussion on that plan? Okay. Okay. Um, we got a was second. That, we? Was that was that unanimous, Gordon? Or uh... no, we haven't voted yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, all in favor? Mary, so, aye. Martha, aye. Curtis, aye. Gordon, aye. Okay. That makes it unanimous. Thank you, Victoria. <clears throat> I attended one of the meetings and it was it was very enlightening, actually. So thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. And you're welcome. Okay. Yeah, thank and, you. Um, the next thing on our list is the um, budget update. So, two, Gordon, let me just interject two, uh, two things here. You should probably take care of uh, Mr. Smith, Arthur Smith, um, with the Elder Justice Project, so you can we can okay. move him along as well. However, before you go there, we skipped over public comments. Oh. And uh, I don't see him here, but I did get an email just prior to the meeting from uh, Bill Mason. Uh, and um, he just had uh, a question on the graffiti on the trees and the guardrail out on Weed Road. Wanted to know what had been done about that. He makes a comment about how it looks like the guardrail was painted over but the trees are still as is uh, and what we're going to do and and are the trees just going to kind of grow up um or, or is it going to wear off uh just as far as the um the person doing it, we did notify both the constable and the Vermont State Police. Uh, I don't believe they found anybody, but um, they were notified, and I know that they did do some some drive-bys, particularly um, James, for a little bit during that time. <clears throat> I haven't spoken to the highway department, so if it's been rectified, that's something Bill took on and did himself. Um, I'm not aware of us painting over the guardrail, the town doing it. And I'll just say that we don't have any plans to do anything with the trees um, as the town. So I'll just, um, you know, I'll just, that, I guess that's my answer. <clears throat> hey Dave. 
I yes, can sir. I can shed a little light on this. Okay. Um, Tom Kennedy bought some silver spray paint and sprayed the guardrail, and then he took some paint that. Um, it's good thing the state for... police didn't come by as he was out there with a <laughs> can, you know. All right. <laughs> And then he took some paint that he had bought for our, our windows and I didn't like, and he used that on the uh, wooden guardrail. So those two are taken care of. So then actually maybe Rob, you could help us with the solution for the, um, for the trees. Um, there's orange paint and white paint, spray paint on the bark of the trees. What color was the tree before? It was brown. So maybe Tom could get a can of brown spray paint. Well, no, come on, Rob. That's probably going to kill the tree. No, I don't think it'll hurt the tree. Really? Yeah. OK. okay. Maybe, a wire, maybe a wire brush. Oh, a wire brush. Maybe. You know who Here's will be the... doing? This will be Mary O'Brien's job, not Tom Kennedy's. I'll tell you that right now. A wire brush may do more harm than the paint would. Oh, have conflicting con. Uh, Maybe discussion. we could just hold a sheet up over the tree so you can't see the graffiti. Rob, there are like five trees that have this. Are they hemlocks? I don't know what they are, Gordon. They could be ash trees. If they're ash trees, and if you would have gone to the identification seminars, Mary, you would know, then they could just yeah. come back. Yeah, I, I'm hoping they're ash trees, actually. I, I don't know what they are. I haven't gotten that far. Well, Mary, if you're not at the next meeting, we'll know you're locked up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or sheet in front of the trees. Right. I'm All right, just, well, I'll figure this out. I'll do something. I'm just surprised, Mary, that those wonderful beach chairs out in front of your house didn't get hit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I told Tom, this stupid time to put them out there. Wait until the summer. But anyway, yeah. Well, Dave, uh, Dave, Dave, I did do public comments because we talked with Wes. We just didn't have the right public. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. We did, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, the budget update is for last year, I assume. I uh, no, no. Why don't you, uh, real quick, before we do that, why don't you, uh, why don't you do Mr. Smith? Oh, okay. Arthur Smith with the uh, the Elder Justice Project. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Smith, are you there? Yes, you are. I can see you. I'm here. Can you hear me? You can. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening um, about elder abuse here in Windsor County. Uh, my name is Arthur Smith. I am the Department of Justice grant coordinator for a grant that was funded to address elder abuse here in Windsor County. And more generally, abuse in later life is a harm with growing numbers during COVID. And these growing numbers are consistent with our state's population trends. Uh, in the current Vermont State Plan on Aging, the prediction is that by 2030, less than 10 years away, 25% of all Vermonters will be over the age of 65. And of course, there are many ways of being over the age of 65. But generally speaking, there are um, age-related cognitive changes for all in this age cohort, such as slower speech and some decline in word retrieval, to name a few. And there's the fact that decline begins for everyone after the age of 60. But importantly, aging alone does not affect the reliability of information recall. Despite ageist assumptions that all older adults who seem confused and afraid have cognitive impairments, most older adults do not have dementia. However, the older an individual is, 
the greater the odds that they have some form of dementia. So assessing capacity is confusing. When someone in later life in your, in your community appears to be having some difficulties and a neighbor wants to help, or the elder reaches out themselves because they believe they're being abused or neglected by a caregiver or financially exploited, how do we help? The Department of Justice grants that I'm funded by is helping communities identify gaps in their support services for those in later life who have been mistreated and is helping in the development of protocols for collaboration between law enforcement and other community partners to better serve. We have trained boots on the ground, first respond to your police officers to better understand what they see and how they question, and investigators and detectives on how to collect evidence. We have asked them to conduct a self-assessment inventory of their training and policy needs. This feed feedback is instrumental. So whomever polices or is the law enforcement for your community, it's a good idea to know the extent of they participated in this assessment. Under the grant, we have also trained service providers across the county on state civil and criminal remedies that provide relief to vulnerable adults. But there are gaps in the services that are available, and communities need to brainstorm on how best to respond to elder abuse. To name a few of the gaps, adult protective services will investigate the mistreatment of abused elders, but only if they're considered vulnerable, which broadly speaking means they're living in a skilled nursing facility in need of assistance uh, for activities of daily life or have cognitive impairments that require assistance for finance, and, or they're unable to protect themselves. Just broadly speaking, these are the areas uh, APS looks into. And domestic violence service providers, such as WISE and the Women's Freedom Center, focus on intimate partner abuse, not only abuse by a caregiver. And police officers on call, uh, especially in cases of reported financial exploitation, often find themselves in situations with insufficient evidence for probable cause in order to make an arrest. All of these are gaps. Why do I bring them up to you? Well, there's going to be an ask at the very end, but let me go on. The numbers of elders falling to these gaps are growing. Our grant has promoted a model that's been successful across the county. The Coordinated Community Response Model, which brings together a multidisciplinary team from across disciplines. The Council on Aging, Here's Senior Solutions, FAST, the Financial Abuse uh, financial abuse uh, specialist team, HDRS social workers, prosecutors, uh, law enforcement, and restorative justice. We bring them together on a regular basis to discuss patterns. What are we seeing in our communities? And the community resource, the resources that we have. Also, grant, grant availability. We also share information. A good example is a scam that just recently came through our uh, communities. Um, back, back in September, right before Rosh Hashanah, there was several requests by someone who reported to be a rabbi asking for funding for people who were in the hospital. We made that, that scam available, and across the county, we found many other people finding a similar experience with similar scams. And as a side note, there are creative models to help address local problems. One such problem we've had several times with regards to financial exploitation is that the financial exploitation is happening within the family by grandchildren, by children taking advantage of grandparents or parents. And the difficulty is that most grandmothers or mothers don't want law enforcement involved. So how can we remedy the problem when they realize if the, if the taking keeps on continuing. They won't have money for heating. They won't have money for medicine. They won't have money for food. So we have one model that we've developed through restorative justice, 
which brings together a number of community um, partners helping guide the discussion with family members on what can be done and what needs to be done. To the extent to which this works, we've looked at research on profiles most likely to be successful in this type of model. Those profiles where family members show remorse, where they live in close proximity, where they're willing to continue to make it work within the family. So I guess the ask is this, will your community post on your website our roadmap that shows all the resources we have here in Windsor County? Will your community participate in the coordinated community response that occurs uh, every three months? And will you look into the extent to which the law enforcement in your community is participating in the self-assessment that helps develop workable policies that protect <clears throat> elders in our community from abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation? Thank you. Um, it seems <clears throat> seems to me that that pub, um, publishing the so-called roadmap is a kind of a no-brainer. Something that could be easily be done. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think maybe it could be mentioned on the listserv too that it's that it's on once it's posted or put on the website um, so that people know it's there. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then um, I have some questions for you, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, so you, in your flyer, it says that you've educated the Hartford Police Department but how about the state police, Windsor Police Department, Woodstock Police Department, are they involved? Uh, we hosted um, several law enforcement and they were broadly throughout the state and throughout the county because we were training both investigators and detectives at their senior level and boots on the ground um, on, on more of the basic um, skills tests that were us. Uh, skill sets that were needed. So when it comes to collection of evidence that was primarily addressed to detectives and investigators, but these weren't limited to um, one area. They were provided for all people, uh, primarily um, posted at the police academy um, in Pittsburgh and uh, distributed, uh, distributed throughout the state. The greatest response was for those people uh, and an encouragement for those people in Windsor County. But um, we are anticipating future trainings. So what we're really hoping is for some type of buy-in. And the other type of the buy-in is in addition to the training for law enforcement, is just to make sure people have um, an understanding of where they can go and a place to discuss the issues in their community. And that's where the coordinated community response model comes in, where people participate through Zoom in finding out what's going on, scams, um, neglect. I think there are a lot of issues right now uh, that have to do with um, caregivers. It's a very difficult time to find caregivers to provide for people who are in the community. So these are all um, forums of discussion, and that's what we're hoping for buy-in. They're almost all conducted now by Zoom. So. Um, what you could easily do is give an update on what your community is doing and information you might find helpful. So, uh, is it Arthur or Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith. Um, uh, Arthur is great. Thanks. Arthur, yeah. Uh, this is Phil Hobby. Um, have, as you know, Heartland has a, a community nurse program through Agent and Heartland. Um, there is a satellite program as of, of Upper Valley nurses that that the community nurses are involved with. Have you reached out to that group with, with any training? 
Uh, well, we have it, it reached out to a number of groups, Patch being one of them, uh, Jill Board being another one. Uh, unfortunately, we, we no longer have one of our outreach workers that was committed to um, more of that type of uh, community engagement. Um, I'm looking more at a policy level, um, working with APS, Adult Protective Services, and looking at their policies and then how those were implemented and the impact they have at the local level. Um, probably the difference that I'm hearing with some of their outreach programs is that we're primarily addressing not just the health issues, but and that is a part of the neglect, certainly, but broader abuse and even financial exploitation, which during COVID, these are the calls we're getting more and more, um, uh, getting more, more frequency. Okay. But thank you for that reminder. I didn't really catch your answer. Was that a yes? You did reach out to this group, or no? You did not reach out to this group. Uh, I can't. I, I don't know whether or not Keely Marie, if she had been the outreach worker, had reached out to them specifically. But I, I know the groups that I'm um, trying to follow her tracks in, and one of those uh, is uh, a nursing. Jill Ward at one of the local hospitals runs one, and there's a patch that I just attended earlier, or I guess late last week, that was. A, based at a hospital. So I am going back to the medical model, um, although the, the objectives might here be uh, somewhat differentiated. Okay, thank you. Arthur, Arthur, maybe as part of that answer, um, you may want to clarify how you're coming in behind that, that someone else has started this effort and you're coming in afterwards. Um, yeah. Is that correct? Well, uh, we have an outreach worker that's primarily focused on working with local community organizations and um, efforts and uh, was divided by the Department of Justice into two separate branches. One branch was looking at the policy aspect and that's where my legal background comes in and I'm looking at how the laws are structured and the extent to which policy as written has an impact on how it is actually uh, in practice. And Keeley was looking more at um, how are we exchanging information with different resources in the community to see whether or not we have um, a means or, or protocol for getting information to people most likely to be able to make good use of it. So a, a little bit different objective, but as our grant uh, it is, it is starting to close, um, we are, are continuing only one aspect of that, and um, it's, it's hard to integrate all of her efforts uh, in, into what I've been attempting to do, although I, I, I'm aware that it's very worthwhile to have uh, the health model or the medical model uh, adhered to and incorporated. Arthur, um, this is Curtis. I have a question for you. As I'm sure you're aware, the 2018 state plan on aging has a pretty extensive section on elder justice and abuse prevention. And they have a whole set of goals, goal three that is outlined, that has multiple sub goals and performance measures underneath it. And I was wondering if you could just talk to me a little bit about how your efforts dovetail uh, with those of the state. They don't dovetail, they're actually identified in that state plan you're referring to especially in the area of financial exploitation. They're looking at this grant as a pilot project for the whole state. So if you go back and look at that document, um, you'll see that uh, we're referenced quite clearly um, as the uh, pilot for how financial exploitation may be better integrated into a model throughout the state. And that's uh, actually what we're working on now, trying to see where this um, focus can continue to have um, viability. So the question is, does this need to be a 501c3 that's independent of the Council on Aging, or could this be incorporated through um, hiring for individuals who may be able to maintain independence with regards to maintaining confidentiality? Because a lot of these issues really um, hover around the issue of who is a mandated reporter. So these are the types of issues that we're trying to work out now as we find a home for these efforts and integrate. But one thing that we know with certainty is that the model of a coordinated community response doesn't necessarily require a new 501c3 
it might well very much look like the SIU um, model that's in place currently for children. And the difficulty with uh, in trying to um, replicate that model is that model came um, with funding. So what we have to do now without funding is see how we can continue to provide these services and have individuals who are specially trained without having um, money set aside. And that's the struggle right now because there are many individuals that elders haven't been abused. But this is very much like um, decades ago when nobody was of the opinion that women were being abused in their homes. So domestic violence has come a long way with just a better understanding of how to identify it. And I think that's are one there, of the obstacles we have now, how to identify abuse. So are there, one, of my, one of my questions that was sort of embedded and I think is, is important as we're thinking about um, getting additional funding or transitioning to a different structure, and you say this grant is winding down, my question would be, has the grant gathered information on those performance measures as outlined in the 2018 state plan on aging? And could the could those performance measures be could the numbers behind those performance measures be made available somehow? Well, the difficulty with performance measures right now during COVID is that there's an underreporting in some areas and in other areas. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a statistical analysis that's being done at the state level to try to drive some understanding of what a baseline would look like. And that baseline is um, it's um, information that was retrieved from, I think, 2009 to 2012. Uh, and then the question, looking at it um, from that perspective is, how much of that is consistent, but the baseline has to start somewhere. And so that's what they've been funded to do. So they're pulling out information on each one of these identified areas to try to establish a baseline so that we can see the extent to which the numbers are going up. But if you're looking at tracking of numbers, and that's a difficulty that we have, is that a lot of these um, areas aren't tracked in such a way that you can redact that, or you can extract them from the software package that they currently use. So if you were to go to APS, and I'm on the APS policy committee, you can act up for how many different reports do you have of this kind. And what they would typically tell me is, uh, I can't extract that from the database um, at this time, but we could develop that. And the problem from a Freedom of Information Act request is that you're not entitled to have them produce a new document for you. So it really is based upon their willingness to engage at that level and use their funds at that level to extract the information. Um, and that's a much larger question. So I hear something that's generally just more depressing to me, which is that we, even though these performance measures are outlined under this goal in the state plan on aging, we have no way of assessing our performance on those measures. In, in many ways, I have to agree with you. It, it, it's, it's difficult to, to... And Curtis, you know as well as I do, I've taken enough data and and uh, removed any data that can, can characterize or be identified back to an individual and aggregated it so that you can get those measures. Um, so I'm, I'm disappointed as well. But I, th I think one thing that is encouragement, uh, at least for me, is at the local level, um, people who are engaging in a discussion of how to share uh, the resources that we do have, how to try to fill the gaps. Um, that's meaningful discussion that takes place during these coordinated community response meetings. And uh, as a typical example, um, we're having a very difficult time reaching um, elders who are sequestered and isolated in their homes right now during COVID. And one of the approaches that was uh, suggested was to have public service announcements that would be aired on the public channels that give information. And we had just recorded one this evening. Um, if you see something, say something. Just where to report, what you can do, and have each of us feel a sense of responsibility for looking into these matters and not considering them somebody's, somebody else's problem. And I think
think that's what the coordinated community response model helps. We talk about scams. We talk about what we're seeing as far as food delivery. We're talking about sources of information. We're talking about how we can keep people engaged. Um, and it, it, in many ways, it sounds very soft. Um, when I think about policy, I like something concrete. This is what's going to happen. But that exchange of information, much like the medical model that you brought up earlier, these are very important ways of sharing community resources. Uh, would you mind adding your contact information to into the conversation uh, so that uh, I, would, I would love to follow up um, on that part? Sure. I would hope that the brochure that I uh, that I've sent. Um, I, I don't see any. I don't see your contact information on that. Uh, it, it, there's a small. There's a box on that form that indicates the Vermont Elder Justice Project. It lists a number that I can reach 24/7 on that number, and also um, I can be reached. Uh, I can give you that number right here. I have. Um, it. Is that the eight six six two three zero zero two something? Yes. Okay, so if I want to call talk to you, I call that number? You could call that number, and that number would go to an answering service. If you want to talk to me directly, you just want to give a call, um, typically during the day, this number is best, 802-698-8650. That's 802-698-8650. That's during the day, and actually, um, I forward that to my home phone, so that I can be reached pretty much 24-7. We also provide emergent housing funding. So if someone is in a situation and they have to leave their home, and I know a lot of domestic violence models don't agree with that, but I know a lot of um, situations in which uh, when there are guns involved, it doesn't matter to Esther that um, Owen's been told that he can't go to the house. If he's been living there for 30 years, and he has a gun, she may not feel safe staying in that house. So what we try to do is find emergent housing that would be safe, and so we pay for the transportation in a short-term stay. We also had um, spent quite a bit of time working on emergent housing funding through other grants. Uh, unfortunately, during COVID, one of the grants we were expecting for 200,000 uh, was reduced to 20,000 with the expectation we could reapply. So these are continuing endeavors to find funding. Um, but um, some of these issues need to be discussed in each community. And talking with some chiefs of police in certain areas, they work with uh, a lot of faith communities to find out if there are safe houses that might be available or safe families. So it may be very unique town by town. But there has to be a plan because there are a growing number of people who may be experiencing this issue. And we have to have an idea of how we're going to handle it. And I think that's what the intention of this grant is for. Uh, giving us so, a heads up on the gaps you and giving us a manner to uh, address them. Yeah. Um, so you had, you had three asks. One of them was the roadmap on the website. I, I agree with Gordon, that seems pretty straightforward to do. The second one was, uh, I think what you called it was buy-in to the community coordinated community response. Um, the third one, I failed to take notes, I'm sorry, so I... Uh, no problem at all. The third one, um, the National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life developed a self-assessment tool for law enforcement. It's a probably, I think, in total, right around 17 pages. It's an inventory. So depending upon the law enforcement that's serving your community, the question would be to them, have you completed assessment? Because what it helped guide us is to look at what needs to be done. You know, as far as policy, as far as the interventions, as a systematic step-by-step -step assessment of where they are addressing elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. I think, uh, so I, if I'm, yeah, I'm not mistaken, uh, James is, is on the call right now, and I know, so James is our constable, Arthur, and James has indicated to me that he's worried about abuse generally as well, especially in this time of, of isolation. Um, so 
that also seems like something that we could we could pose um, to have done that that inventory. Um, to me, that seems like something that could be useful. So I would like additional um, clarification on the second ask, the buy-in. So it sounds to me like you've proposed sort of multiple levels of buy-in, uh, not distinct. It's continuous scale, of course, but um, it's where you have just participation in a call so everyone knows what problems are happening. And then I presume, since your, switch, your grant is winding down, that you're actually actively searching for funding from towns and participating towns. So can you expand a little more exactly what you mean by buy-in in the coordinated community response? Right now, we're not really looking for funding. We're looking at self-sufficiency because the model that we intend to use or hope to leave behind is a model of uh, where the community is engaged in information exchange on a periodic basis. It's very much like the child study um, periodic, I think it's monthly, child study teams. And uh, I think it was Jim Caston that said he found those very beneficial to have um, periodic updates on what's going on in the area. And uh, those uh, would involve, and we've had some uh, commitment on the part of Adult Protective Services to engage on a monthly basis with this information ex exchange and sharing would also look at the extent to which there may be new fundings coming in. Right now there are a lot of COVID fundings that may be applicable in some ways. So it would really be a coordinated response where people are coming together on a topic and an agenda that's discussed and shared in advance and uh, trying to problem solve some of the issues that are raised. And you know, it, it's um, not money asking now, um, but um, it depends on where this is going to go. I, I think where the money comes in is training. We're trying to find ways of training uh, first responders, service providers, as well as detectives and investigators um, in a forum, in a format as well, that wouldn't cost. That's something we're working with the police academy right now. What um, property interest is there on the types of um, end call uh, videos and videos retrieved from other areas. So if we bring that library together, what type of um, permission or permissions do we need to have? And so some of this is trying to brainstorm how much can we do on a shoestring? So um, Arthur, what, for that co coordinated community response participation, uh, would you be looking for a member of the select board to be represented on that or anyone from the town or what sort of form, formalism in the involvement are you seeking? Well, it could be at any level. It, there's no restriction. Um, typically, we have um, HCRS social workers involved. We have the state's attorney's office. We have the attorney general's office. We have um, uh, the special in investigation unit uh, involved. We have WISE involved. So we have domestic violence involved. Um, it's not really limited to a certain type of professional function, but rather uh, one of commitment and community engagement. So if you have individuals who are very knowledgeable about the needs of your community, it seems like they would be very appropriately um, participating in, in, in that information exchange. So what I'd be happy to do is discuss that further with anyone that uh, might have an interest in, in seeing how your community could be represented. Um, so if I can boil this down, it sounds like there are three asks. Publish the roadmap on the website, have community participation in the coordinated community response, and request that the, our law enforcement complete the self-assessment. Thank you, that's an excellent, I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't make it more clear, but those are the asks. No, nope, that's I'm glad you help me out on that. And I'm going to go to the agent and Heartland Board of Directors to basically ask for a buy-in there. And that's why I asked for your phone number so I can discuss that offline with you. And I think that would be an excellent community representation for, for town. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're very generous okay. to give you some time this evening. And uh, I look forward to hearing back from you on any other issues you might have. And look forward to your engagement in the community coordinated community response. Thank you. Thanks for Thank coming you. in. Thanks very much. It's a great project. I hope it continues.
I do too. Thank you. Dave, <clears throat> you want to go over the budget now? Sure. <clears throat> So um, we're pretty well following the same path that we have um, since maybe the first month in. Uh, it's kind of the way things kind of go sometimes. Uh, the year just kind of paints a picture and, and that's the way we're going. And uh, so far we're, uh, we're continuing on that path. So the general fund continues to be um, very healthy, uh, at least budget-wise, the way we're looking. Um, there's two... Departments that uh, we've had our eyes on for um, since summertime. One is the listers um, due to uh, Doug Winnell um, retiring and um, some, some overlap there as far as hours and um, employees. And the transition seems to be going smooth. Doug will be talking a little bit uh, in a little bit regarding the errors and admissions. Um, if you'd like, you can always ask him questions on that. But um, from what I can see, uh, Cheyenne's been in and uh, seems to be making a nice transition. Um, but again, this is a department that we've been keeping an eye out. Remember that this um, budget sheet that you have in front of you is through the end of October or into November at this point, but it's through October. Uh, so it's a little bit earlier on in the process um, than where we're at now. But um, uh, again, we look pretty good uh, in the Worcester's office at this moment. Again, after the end of four months, we're about 33% spent um, at this point. The other one is the town clerk's office. Uh, again, we got the transition there with Clyde, Brian Streffolino, and uh, Emma Sawyer. Uh, again, we're a little bit heavier than we normally would be, but um, again, that transition seems to be going smoothly. Uh, Brian seems to be a nice fit. Uh, and um, certainly seems to be pretty eager to take on uh, take in new information. So both of those look pretty good at this point. Uh, if there is any doubt, uh, it is on the revenue sheet, but um, we did get uh, about 25, I want to say, uh, $1,000, um, 24, 24,500 from the Department of Children's and Families for the rec center. So that now is in the revenue side uh, of the general fund. Uh, we should look at that as kind of buffering the rec center, but um, I think that there'll be enough to kind of buffer the overages that we might have in the listers um, and the town clerk's office. So that's good news for the general fund, uh, both on the revenue and expense side. Overall, from uh, a budget point of view, again, the assessment, which is kind of the Vermont State Police, the, the ambulance and some of our debt payments, um, uh, a majority of that's been paid at this point. So when I look at the budget uh, this early on, I kind of back out the assessment section and the appropriations because the appropriations have essentially been spent as well. And uh, that leaves us at about 31, just under 31% spent. So, so far the expenditures are under budget. Um, so that is good. So the general fund looks um, pretty good at this point. The highway funds we have been talking about since July, uh, even June, because we knew that um, Martinsville Road was going to be an issue uh, that ended up being a repair in, in uh, after July 1st in Clay Hill Road uh, also hit us. So between the two of those, um, Clay Hill Road and uh, Martinsville, even if we take on the grant that um, we may be getting for Martinsville Road, if you take in the fact that we got to pay 20% of Martinsville, we end up being about $55,000, $60,000 over budget due to those two. Uh, however, that bad news is offset by some good news. The state of Vermont was very kind and gave us essentially $42,500. So that'll close the gap on our deficit, um, a good deal in the highway fund. That money that they essentially gave to us uh, came, uh, what they did was 
every year they have basically a structures grant and a paving grant through the state of Vermont. It's given out to certain towns on a yearly basis. Uh, they funded that this year. The legislative session funded um, the budget very late. It didn't happen until the fall. So that program was funded. Um, however, the state didn't wasn't prepared for the funding technically. So what they decided to do is instead of putting it towards those particular grants, they decided, and it's seven million dollars that the um, state allocates to the agency of transportation for this. They decided to simply pass on that seven million dollars to all Vermont towns. So our piece of that pie was forty-two thousand four hundred twenty-seven dollars. So we got that um, just because. Again, it came at a good time um, due to the fact that we're close to $60,000 over, so it really helps close the gap. Just remember the two other places that were over, uh, guardrails were about $5,000 over budget on that. And we're going to end up being most likely over budget on the sand. Um, we did um, call D&D &D excavating for some, actually we, they helped grind our sand, but um, they did help truck uh, sand for us in our yearly migration from the sand pit to uh, Brownsville Road, our, our um, pit over at Brownsville Road or our, our um, sand pit, essentially. Uh, due to the fact that we have the um, cut through on through the Pikes Pit, um, there really wasn't a way that we were going to be able to move that effectively. The early part of the process, we really need to move. We can't, we basically run out of room um, the way that they um, essentially manufacture the sands. So we got to move it quickly. So we needed D&D's help to do that. So that'll probably push it a little bit on the sands. Uh, remains to be seen. Um, so that's kind of it in the highway department. What was looking to be um, tough is offset by the 42,500 um, and um, that helped us out quite a bit. Um, still over, but we do have the surplus uh, in the highway fund as well to kind of cushion that. Um, so hopefully we don't run into one of those annual rain events, storm events that um, we were talking about earlier with the hazard mitigation plan it seems to happen yearly at this point. But um, if we stay away from that, hopefully we can end the year strong and um, uh, close the close the gap as we go. Hey, thank you, Dave. Hey, well, we have to wind up this lister issue, I guess. That's here. Um, it's obvious what the problem. Uh, it's obvious. But, uh, it's, um, is Doug? Is Doug? Yeah, yes, I'm you here. are. Yep. Uh, you just looking for <clears throat> uh, which document you have in front of you first? We've got two items. Um, I've got the one that says errors and omissions. Okay. Yes, we had just one one case this year. Somebody notified us of uh, outbuildings coming down, and with the COVID world and all that, we we kind of crossed our wires, and then uh, we're reminded of that later. And so we feel they did uh, contact us and let us know, and that was our bad. So. That's what that adjustment is. Uh, and the other uh, the other document uh, for no appeals pending for 2018. Um, we had our last appeal uh, resolve in February at the Supreme Court. And so this is more of a formality that says uh, there's nothing else to expect from the tax year 2018 it's all uh, all the appeals have run their course and there's no further adjustment expected for that year that's all good news so. yes 
<laughs> we have um, we've had uh, hearings for appeals for 2019, but they all those results have not come in yet. But um, we're expecting those probably in December. But uh, and when when they all come in, we'll be able to uh, offer you one for 2019. All right, so we can uh, we can come in and uh, the back room, I guess, and find these. Do you want a motion, Gordon? Do we need one to sign? This? I don't know that we. I don't. I'm not so sure we need a motion. We're going to sign and say. I would. Uh, I would. I would make a motion for um, for the for the minutes, Gordon. Okay. Just, um, for the record. Okay. okay. So we got two things. One is. Uh, one is to uh, accept the uh, list as um, error, error and uh, um, on the uh, let's see. yeah on the uh, Potter property um, as as stated. So we could do that first. Okay. Um, Sixteen thousand three hundred dollar. It's so, not really an error. It's uh, it's a um, the buildings were torn down. Uh, they misplaced the uh, the uh, notice. I guess it's not really an error. It's just a it's just a delayed. Uh, um, acceptance of the change. I can go ahead and do that if you want. Okay, sure. I move that we accept form PVR 4261E right. as presented. That sounds pretty good. Uh, Curtis, if I could throw, just for the record, I would just mention a Samuel B. Potter, a reduction of 16,300 from 194,600 to 178,300. I'll move. Martha, did you get that? Uh, I think I'm getting it. I don't know that I got it word for word that, that what you just said. Just mentioned that it's the Potter property. Yep. And the amount of the reduction. 16,300. Okay. <laughs> From 194,600 to 178,300. So essentially, oh. the second line on that form. Yeah. All those numbers you want in the minutes, is that correct? Yep. Okie dokie, I'll do that. I'll second the motion. This is Mary. Okay. All in favor? No. Mary, aye. Bill, aye. Martha, aye. aye. All right. Okay. The second thing is to. Um, to um, see, I don't know just how we do this. Certify, I guess, that there are no no appeal or suits or suit pending at the time at this time. And make a motion uh, that states that. So I move that we certify that there are no appeals or suits pending um, for tax year 2018. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Mary, aye. Bill, aye. Martha, aye. Gordon, aye. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to exit and have some supper. See you later. Good night, Doug. Thank, Thank you.
Okay, the um, we haven't done the accounts of pay, accounts payable, and, and they were listed in our online documents, but not. I didn't. We didn't, at least I didn't get them in the mail. Yeah, the only number that jumped out at me was the Pike. Uh, 103,468 something, um, and that's as I understand it. I believe from the what I wrote this morning is that for the county road, the work on the county road. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, Dave, there was one item which I I don't understand. It said Comcast maintenance. Um, it was um, two times, 10.30 and 11.16, $951. What does that mean? It means our truck hit a wire and knocked down a utility pole okay. and created a small brush fire, but we try not to, you know, we try not to put that out there too loud. But uh, well, that's that's the charge for the utility. Sorry, I brought it up. Portion of that. Um, didn't we have something like that a couple of weeks ago too? Yes, yes, we did. It it, it involved a a vehicle. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, it was uh, that was a minor hit mishap um, that literally happened back, I think, in April. Um, so they're just getting around to kind of the way utilities move. They're just getting around to billing us for that. But um, that's what that's for. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Phil, I think you should make a motion. I don't think you've made a motion tonight. Um, but I don't have the date of the warrant in front of me. Um, uh, Dave. Up to the 16th. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the accounts payable as of November 16th. I'll second that. This is Mary. Any other discussion? No. Okay, all in favor? Curtis, aye. 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 Bill, aye. Martha, aye. aye. Yeah. Okay. We're losing energy here with our eyes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're down to managers' notes. Says you have 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm sure you limit me after we, uh, <laughs> you blew the agenda out of the sky with the uh, <laughs> with that one fifteen minute agenda item one forty five, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, big Come on, Dave, you can do it. Dave, that was a minute you just took. <laughs> COVID nineteen virus. Today we had one hundred and twenty two cases. Another new high for Vermont. Uh, it seems to be where we're going, although uh, a big asterisk there, a lot of the cases are happening in and around Montpelier, um, which seems to be stemmed from the hockey team that um, played together and um, seems to be creating or, or accounting for a large percentage of this. But nevertheless, it is up across the state and across the nation. Um, so we did take steps today um, we essentially closed uh, Damon Hall again to the public however uh, there is a need for people to get in for you know transactions and sales and and um, there's there's things that um, people need to access we are available for that uh, by appointment um, the finance uh, the staff is here um, the finance office is open, clerk's office is open, Lister's is open by phone. 
um, and preferably just the clerk's office by appointment. But um, if need be, we can set up an appointment for the other offices as well. Uh, that being said, we took steps last week, um, maybe even the week before, but uh, we took steps uh, to basically limit interactions between the staff. Um, we actually took quite a few, and the whole idea here is to be able to stay open if um, members of the staff get sick. So the first steps that we took, um, we essentially set up some some a table in the back uh, right by the back door and um, Bill and John um, only enter into that back um, wouldn't even call it a room just kind of a um, you know where you step in before you come into the kitchen they drop off their timesheets and they pick up their mail there without coming all the way into Damon Hall uh, and John and Bill uh, and John and the highway crew also should not be interacting. Um, that's to keep, um, if somebody in Damon Hall gets sick, doesn't mean that the, the highway department is going to need to quarantine or, or stop working or hopefully get sick. Um, and the same is if an outbreak happens at the rec center with the after school program, it doesn't kind of filter out to the highway crew or Damon Hall and we can continue those uh, each one can operate independently if need be. We've also taken the additional steps of splitting up the staff uh, here at Damon Hall, uh, the highway crew as well. Um, can't really do that with the rec center, but um, Damon Hall, um, basically Michelle and uh, Martin have been split. So um, theoretically anyways, um, we don't lose them both and uh, as has Clyde and uh, has been split from Emma and Brian. Makes it a little bit difficult to train Brian, but um, hopefully some of that time on his own uh, will force him to do that. Clyde is at home, he has access to a computer, he has access to his files um, and access to his um, email. Uh, so he is only a phone call away, same with Michelle and Martin. So starting today, uh, Michelle, um, Clyde and myself are working Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I will be remote Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Clyde is remote and uh, Michelle uh, will be available to continue to work on the town report um, and um, other things that she does outside of the finance office. Martin, uh, I'm sorry, and Cheyenne will be working Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Doug will be working, Martin will be working, and Emma and Brian will be working. So again, the theory is here is that, um, for instance, if uh, Michelle gets sick, um, most likely those that have interacted with her, being myself, Clyde, and uh, Cheyenne, um, would potentially need to quarantine. That leaves the office still able to operate. Um, they would come in full time, that being Martin, um, Brian, Emma, and Doug. Uh, therefore, uh, again, the concept here is to stay open uh, regardless. Uh, the highway crew's been split up as well. Um, again, much like the spring, we've gone to three and three. Uh, the concept here is that to prioritize our winter maintenance being plowing and sanding um, to be able to do that. Uh, if we were to lose uh, the entire staff or even half of the staff, it uh, becomes very difficult um, to do that. Um, however, I'd rather try and do it with four. Uh, again, Evan's kind of on his own. Um, that would give us four. If um, one of the teams becomes sick, uh, we can still plow on sand. Um, may take us a little bit longer, but we can still do it effectively. We've done it. Um, before without skip at appendicitis and we lost Dan there in the winter time so we've operated with four. Um, so if one of those teams becomes uh, sick or needs to quarantine and we have a snowstorm or, or a rainstorm or something to that effect we can still operate um, with Evan running the, um, the one ton and we can get the routes done. If we don't do that it's maybe still doable just really doesn't look all that optimal um, if we lose the highway crew uh, we would need to subcontract that out 
Um, sounds easy enough, but these guys all have their own uh, plow roots. Uh, they also, um, if they don't have plow roots, they do something else in the winter time. Uh, and they don't know the roots. Um, so to get to know that effectively would take a few snowstorms. So if we had to rely on that, it would be expensive and um, um, maybe not even possible. And the other concept that we've kind of talked tossed around is having, um, you know, mutual agreements between other towns. But again, um, you know, the town is going to prioritize their own town first, uh, and then they would come over and help, uh, say, Heartland, or, you know, Heartland would go over and help West Windsor or, or Hartford or whatever it is. Again, they don't know the plow routes. So going into the winter um, creates kind of a um an issue for us unlike in the spring we in the spring we wanted to keep the road maintenance going so that you know we didn't accumulate abundance of potholes we still had that stuff the winter time is a whole nother ball game um we really you know the dependability on being able to treat the road so that people can get to work um people can get to the hospital they can get to the doctor they can get to school uh buses can move is important to us so we've taken that step or will be taking that step in the next couple of days here as soon as the, the sand is put to bed. So those are some of the steps that we've taken um, uh, as of this, you know, last week, this week, and at the end of this week um, to try and protect ourselves and be able to provide a product um, in case one or a couple of us get sick, we can still operate. I think that that's somewhat important. Uh, and we do prioritize school snow routes. Uh, so the school snow routes get prioritized um, first uh, on a regular basis. That's part of our snow plowing plan. But um, certainly to be able to have the crew to do that, I think is um, kind of the discussion that we've been having internally and, and what we're trying to put into place here. Anybody have any questions on that part of the update? I do, Dave. Um, if the school um, goes to all remote learning, will you switch out that priority to something else? Uh, no, we'll still we'll still make sure that we've got the road crew hopefully in a position to be able to respond to icy or snowy weather. Um, if it's any indication like last winter or the winter before when we had quite a bit just to keep the town functioning and be able to get people out to get groceries and you know that they're not you know subject to being in their home more than they have to you know even people that have been you know working from home or working remotely or have been laid off or something still need to get out and get the basic needs so I think it's important that we try and do that. Um, you know, if we can't. Yeah, that, 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 that's not what I meant. I, I meant, so right now your priority is to um, to get the school bus routes cleaned up first. So what if the school isn't open? Then what becomes a priority? So then we just, uh, so then we just revert back to, we've got essentially five plow routes. Um, what we do from like on a normal day from three to seven or, or four to seven or whenever we come in, we, we prioritize the plow routes and the plow routes don't necessarily follow the five routes that in each individual plow truck has. So we go out and we do those school routes first and foremost and make sure that those are drivable before we go off and do the rest of the plow routes. So one that always comes up in discussion, for instance, is Cream Pot Road um, is not on, is not, hasn't been on until this year. It's been a few years since it's been on a, a school route. Uh, so they didn't get done first, even though it's a pretty big hill. Uh, so residences, you know, we heard quite a bit from Cream Pot Road. This year they are, um, you know, part of the school route. So they get done first. If not, then they've, there's five individual sections and it's set up so that they take a right turn each time they need to take a turn. 
try and do it efficiently in, in a timely manner. Um, so it, it's a route that they do once the kids are in school, they come back to this these individual plow routes. So if there's no school, they just start off doing their individual plow route. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And it was a comment that um, I didn't think of, but it was a pretty good comment. Um, if they end up being going back to remote learning, um, they probably will be doing the school lunches again, the school lunch program. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. So we would need to kind of ensure that that was in place. And that actually did occur in the springtime. We had one or two times where we had some late snowfalls and we got a phone call from um, David Baker and we needed to kind of switch gears and go back to making sure that the, the school buses could get through. Dave, I have an awkward question. Um, I'm assuming that when you're talking about splitting the upstairs offices, you're talking about people, some people working in the office or working remotely for the town. Um, but when you're talking with the highway crew, are, are we furloughing people or are we absorbing and just giving them, you know, we can't give them work, I assume. We are absorbing that. Uh, and I've had a conversation with somebody about that. So um, everybody, including the foreman, has access to um, files and shared files with the system that we now have internally. Uh, however, with the three rank and file guys that'll be at home, uh, we can't cut a tree or dig a hole remotely. Um, so they are not, they don't have that capability. However, unlike myself or unlike uh, the teacher or the student that's sharing split time, um, if it snows, and two in the morning, they are going to be up and they'll be out working 10, 12, 14 hours. So, um, you know, they are on. If it snows, uh, they will all need to come in. Um, we just feel as though in a snowstorm, we feel fairly confident, not absolutely confident because things do still happen. Um, they can come into their individual trucks, go out get the sand and, and do what they need to do without any inner or, or limited overlapping in the town highway garage, which is where a lot of this happens. In the normal course of business, uh, you know, people have to go to the bathroom, you know, we need to go back for things, um, you know, equipment breaks down, which still can happen in the winter time. Um, but we think we feel pretty confident that we can keep them separated during a snowstorm. But then again, that's kind of why we've got them home is so that when it does, we can we can clear the roads. Thank you. Um, I wonder just to sort of build off of Phil's question. I, for what it's worth, I think that's entirely the correct idea, Dave. Um, support it completely. Um, is there is there anything that can be done um, during that time, like? So I put in the chat, I put training, but I wonder even things like helping the Conservation Commission with ash tree identification or things that things that can be done on their own that the town has in one way or another identified as as a worthwhile thing to do. I don't know what, what you think about that. Uh, to be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, we kind of pulled the trigger on this on, on Friday, so um, the, the, the thought process was just how can we, um, right. what's the best way that we think that we can survive if. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've gotten towards, um, you know, anything beyond that. I think those are all reasonably good ideas. Um, you know, it may depend a little bit on their capabilities at home. Um, those are all good things that we can talk about. I think it was a matter of, you know, we've been looking at this. We've been kind of waiting for it. We've been hearing that it's going to happen. But I'll be honest, you know, they keep saying it, but I'll be honest, the numbers, how quick and how high they jumped um, was a little surprising, to tell you the truth. I think for all of us. 
I, I think I think that like like was said already, like that's the right choice to make. I, I fully support it. I only have 0.2 miles to get from my road to Route 5. So for me, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but I can only imagine how horrible it would be if the road crew wasn't able to go out after a big snowstorm. So completely the right idea. It would be, I, I if, if we can use that time beneficially, like in line with their duties, their job description and their capabilities at home and all of that stuff, I think that would be really cool. But I, I get why you made the choice that you did and did it at the time scale that you did. Um, yeah, and I, I think that, um, and again, we haven't really gotten this far, but I think that we will need to perhaps still reach out to some contractors and even to a couple of towns as, you know, as a what if. We really don't want to have to go down that path, but I think we'd be remiss to not, you know, start to keep a tally of, okay, if this happens, we can we can call these people. Um, again, hopefully, you know, we had all sorts of fears back in the spring and we were able to get through that, you know, just fine. And, and um, but, uh, you know, until the vaccine comes through, you know, it's just kind of an unknown at this point. Um, and I think that a lot of what I'm seeing is I've seen a lot of shutdowns, at least for the holiday period, you know, and get through to like uh, Martin Luther King Day, um, you know, and if you can get through that, then. You know, I think that people see Thanksgiving and Christmas as being, um, you know, kind of a spreader opportunity. So as far as maybe a, a first step anyways, let's see what the next six weeks brings. And, and hopefully if we can get through that, we can kind of be on the downswing. But it's definitely a different, definitely a difference going from spring and, you know, the ability to be outdoors and what, what the summer brings versus you know, the winter and, and, you know, not being able to be outdoors and what the, the problems of the winter season can bring is definitely kind of a, a different a difference. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really give it any thought or not as much thought, you know, as recently as two, three weeks ago. So one thing I hope that um, I, I imagine they'll all sort of think this anyway, but it would be worthwhile to communicate really clearly is that you know the goal of doing this is to prevent people from getting sick and so doing things that put you into contact in those times when you're not working is really sure. against that goal <laughs> I, I um that's been yes i i it's gone through our heads i get it i, I you're right um Uh, beyond that, um, three corners intersection, uh, we're looking at um, trying to um, move forward on the easements that are needed for that project, just on the utility part. Um, that has mostly to do with Green Mountain Power, um, whereas before it was all us, they'll write it and um, help get them signed. Uh, beyond that, Mace Hill culvert uh, has been substantially completed the guardrails were put on today i believe there's still some landscaping work that needs to be done to make it uh, more appealing but the nuts and the bolts of the project being the culvert and the um, paving and the guardrails uh, has been complete so again they just need to come back and, and do the landscaping okay is the road is the bridge open right now um i was under i didn't go by today and i haven't talked to bill this afternoon uh it was my impression that once the guardrails went open <laughs> once the guardrails uh went up that it was um, going to be open they almost opened it with just the barriers on the sides and we just de decided to wait till the guardrails went up and we we cleared the, the barriers out so if everything has occurred as described it should be open okay will you put something out if bill confirms that sure no i certainly you know lots of people have been asking and they're driving other directions now so i can tell you i bet you they all watched it uh it wasn't open at 12 30 but they got uh 
I can tell you there's many eyes on that project. So <laughs> once those barrels go away, I don't see any uh, issues, but um, I can I can put something out. Do we need a, a bottle of something sparkling to break on the barrier when it opens or? Uh... I, uh, That's a great idea. It can be the bottle I've been drinking every night since that project's been in place. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, uh, <laughs> I'll save one for the river cut, river ribbon cutting. Um, yeah, so yeah, we can put something out. Um, the next phase will be to ensure that that funding comes in and um, that went from the federal government to the state government. So I'm hopefully hoping to see a grant agreement sometime soon to push that along. But um, that was just, even the construction of it didn't go smoothly. So um, we'll all be, at least myself and Bill will be glad to see that one in the rear view mirror um, quick. Um, Not sure if I mentioned this last meeting, delinquent tax sale. Um, Kevin finally kind of righted the ship there internally, but we're going into Thanksgiving and Christmas, not the best time. Um, and that leaves the February 2nd collection just shortly thereafter. So what we're gonna do is simply save the delinquent tax sale um, until spring, and then we can kind of pull in any large delinquencies that are due after this year, um, after the, the second collection there. So that'll be put off a few more months, um, but um, I believe Kevin's on with us on that. Um, the rec center, um, Jenna Paul was hired for the rec center position, the assistant um, rec director, she's from Springfield. And lastly, uh, we are going to, it's going to cost us a little bit of money, but uh, Laura Bergstresser is going to come back to us and help us with the town report. Um, that is a good thing because um, both Laura and Allison have been doing that the last year or two. And to lose them, you know, leaves Michelle kind of um, in a difficult position. And uh, Emma is only with us through till January. So um, to kind of bridge that gap and to um, see that through is a good thing. So she will be helping us with that this late fall and into the winter. Hey, Dave. Um, I was wondering, so one of the things you said is there's limited knowledge as to how to produce the report. Uh, can we make, can we have that be one of her duties as she produces the report this year that she also helps create some sort of document that will uh, formalize that knowledge and allow it to be done more easily in the future? Um, I'm not entirely sure that, I mean, that's a good idea. Um, and again, this has been kind of, you know, a problem Obviously, policies or procedures written are good because it went from um, Carolyn to Deb to uh, Laura uh, and now to kind of a split here, but uh, mainly Michelle. Um, the layout, so the the pieces are fairly basic, um, being that uh, the reports from the select board and myself and from Martin and um, those pieces have been there kind of year after year. So it's a matter of just making sure that we get those in, et cetera. Um, however, um, the layout work and the software and um, that process, along with passing it on to the printer in a efficient manner um, is kind of it. So um, part of that would be comfort level with the software and how that's done. And I think that there may even Room. I've been talking to Laura and even Michelle a little bit to um, use a better software than what we have been doing. And I think that part of it is, you know, I went from Deb to Laura and Deb was doing it a certain way and Laura upgraded it to 
you know, with um, a little bit of a better software and a better system. But that was kind of like an intermediary. And it, I think there's some agreement that it needs to go to a better place. And I, part of that is um, just getting, I, I don't know if Laura herself feels all that comfortable with that. And Michelle, there's some unknown there. So that's part of the picture of putting this together that we need to get to a little bit better place with. That's it. Okay. 10 minutes. That was a good 10 minutes. Congratulations, Dave. What? Hill. Congratulations. That seemed like 50 minutes, Dave. Well, I'm. It was a stretch, Tam. Okay. Well, I left like a few minutes for questions, so I let it go a little long. It's a Heartland 10. A Heartland 10 minutes. Well, Dave, I do have a question going back to the, um, the budget. And it's the DCF grant restart, the $24,594.85. What the heck is that? Should I know what that is? They just don't. So two things. One, we're way beyond that agenda item. I know, but I you didn't give me a chance when that was the topic. I've moved on mentally, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll be, you know, <laughs> kind of scratching my head here. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure myself, um, other than two things. Um, DCF obviously has a vested interest in ensuring that there is um, capabilities for kids to go after school um, because there, you know, there's obviously with remote learning or even with school or whatever, um, they want to kind of ensure that that's in place. <clears throat> so and there's a, a realization that there's been some lost money um, in some of these programs. For us, it's maybe six months kind of a lag time between some of what we saw in the springtime, um, you know, some outlays in, in programs, but we didn't have anybody participate. So we did have some last, um, you know, we were in a little bit of the hole back in the spring. I think we were talking like 10, 15,000 for a while. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a lag time here. So there's a vested interest there. Uh, ironically, um, they were having a second round of this and that seems to coincide with a news uh it was either on cax or the vermont digger about the state of vermont had some covid some federal covid 19 money that they needed to disperse um or they were going to lose it and we're now seeing a second round uh for this grant so i think that part of this is you know ensuring that the state distributes the federal money that they received and it goes to a, a decent cause so i think that that's part of it okay well that's great I, I that does bring up another question so the highway department are they considered essential workers um they uh, they are yes okay so isn't there money uh like a um, money, COVID money, that the state has like $4 million that you could put in an application for some money for the essential workers and they'll get extra pay? Every now and then I see something regarding it, but I have not seen anything come through me as to what that program is, how it works, or anything to that effect. Mary. So. Um, I, I actually read over these regulations a number of times because I was wrong um, the first time I read over it, so I got to read over it multiple times recently. Uh, so this is the, I believe, the hazard pay um, COVID sort of payout for essential workers. And according to my reading of it, municipalities do not qualify. Well, that stinks because... Um, there's so many essential workers work for municipalities. Well, I wow. think that I think, and this is kind of a weird irony here. 
Um, I think part of this is because the municipalities are, you, you heard Tori talk about the FEMA money for the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, of which we really haven't, um, we haven't aggressively pursued because we haven't really seen anything that's, you know, a lot of that. So I think that that's one of the reasons why it's not going to municipalities. Ironic, I understand the FEMA money that's for like the volunteer, you know, the fire departments, the police departments and stuff like that, PPE and all that good stuff. Um, ironically, it didn't include um, lost pay to highway workers or, or fire workers for that matter, because mm -hmm. they were, um, I can't remember the finer details, but uh, that was discussed back in like May, um, June. But um, so I, I, there is a different, you know, the municipalities have access, much like the DCF money, um, you know, for certain things that, um, you know, we would have access to money through FEMA. We just haven't seen a way to utilize or deal with or want to deal with FEMA at this point um, that maybe the general public can't. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Anybody have anything else? Martha, are you all? I'm still here. Are you good? Do you have any <laughs> questions? I think I'm good. I guess <laughs> I I was thinking we should thank Clyde and Emma and Brian for successfully maneuvering through election day. But Brian just left. Oh, that's too bad. We'll have to make him watch the recording. Tell him there's an Easter egg in it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with how well the day went. Um, so they did a wonderful job. Um, has Clyde announced the date for leaving? Uh, I understand it is it's um, when he feels comfortable with uh, Brian's, where Brian's at. Okay. I just of, saw with the sign outside. I just didn't know if there was a correlation between the date and the sign. Uh, uh, which sign? On the bulletin board. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard an exact date myself, but I'm not always the first to know out of that office. So, um, you know, the way it was explained to me is when he felt as though Brian, he felt good about where Brian was. Um, however, I didn't get the feeling it was going to extend beyond town meeting day. Okay. I, well, I that's, that's say, expensive. I mean, can't we say, hey, you know, January, you're done, bud. I don't, he's elected through to March, though. Uh, I just know that um, Emma goes away. My understanding is Emma goes away in January. So there's, um, and prior to that, um, we had an assistant budgeted for that position. So it's really um, the second part of October, November, December that we're looking at um, that there's potential overage there. Yeah. So it's a super bummer that Brian's gone now because now would be a great time to ask if they've talked at all or are interested at all in Emma continuing on as an assistant. <laughs> she, she's going back to college. I don't think she's available. Is, is she? Okay. Uh, I just don't know the state of the world these days, you know. Yeah, and, and if, if there, since we have budgeted for an assistant, um, it would be nice if Brian saw a full cycle of of town clerk events and so we brian just saw one election uh, a town meeting and so on and so forth so and i will tell you that we were the first town to report our results in either our senate or our house races that's, so that's impressive and i, I will know. tell you the votes in the ballot 
machine kept getting jammed all morning from my first the hours I was there. And, <laughs> and people were asserting, why are you doing, you're, are you miscounting my boat? It was pretty hairy. Thanks, Dave. Have a good night, everyone. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you have to officially. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're in here. Is that my consensus or what? <laughs> I have a motion, a motion to adjourn from someone. A motion to say good night. <laughs> Martha, we haven't heard from you. I move that this meeting be adjourned at 730. Hallelujah. <laughs> Is that a second? A second. A second. Yes, yes, yes. Curtis, I. Bill, I. One of our short meetings.